I noticed that as soon as I bring up in a conversation that I am an antenna designer working in a 5G innovation center, people immediately ask, what do I think about health risks associated with 5G? And uh, after I stumble an awkward answer, they ask something about the pooping regime, uh, stuff like that, where I continue giving awkward answers. But well, I'm definitely not going to make any videos about this seemingly exciting subject, I can make a video about the dangers of millimeter wave. Well, the first thing to say about this is, as you're probably not aware, 5G hasn't really rolled out yet. And this is due to the marketing kind of uh, effort to differentiate between uh, 4G and 5G while keeping exactly the same infrastructure. I will explain. When the first uh, proposals for 5G rollout have been made, the FreeGPP came up with this uh, brilliant idea to separate the rollout of 5G into two stages. One being the non-standalone 5G version and the other being the standalone 5G. While the so-called non-standalone version is effectively just a 4G long-term evolution on steroids. And um, the reason for that is to ease the rollout of the hardware. So to allow network operators to keep the same hardware and roll out the 5G. And after that, it was suggested that the full power of 5G will be unleashed. What actually happened is that companies just rebranded 4G into 5G and they kind of conveniently forgot about this difference between non-standalone and standalone 5G. What we're effectively dealing with now is that 99% of so-called 5G networks in Europe are really just 4G networks with a little bit of uh, software upgrade. In the meantime, while the topic is clearly not as popular as it was during COVID, but if we do open one of those research articles that clearly demonstrate to us the dangers of uh, 5G, then we will read something between the lines of 5G uses much higher frequency, up to 300 gigahertz radio words than in the past, and it makes use of really uh, unevaluated spectrum to enable higher data transmission capacity, and so on and so on. Well, that is simply not true. So um, basically any kind of a research article that uh, tells you this is uh, sheer nonsense. And the other things that I have observed is that um, uh, many uh, people cite proof that uh, when the 5G base station has been installed then uh, suddenly the nearby village got a lot of cancer rates and uh, so on and so forth, again, Typically, 5G base stations are not any different to 4G base stations at the moment. Then, of course, the 5G millimeter wave will roll out even after all the standalone 5Gs that uses band C, otherwise um, known as 3.5 gigahertz spectrum range. Um, the millimeter wave 5G aims to use uh, the spectrum between 24 and 29 gigahertz, which is much higher. However, the rollout of uh, 5G millimeter wave is been uh, disappointing to say the least. Um, in uh, South Korea, for example, the government has been so disappointed with the number of base stations that have been actually deployed for millimeter wave that they recalled the spectrum entirely and put it up on the action again. In the United States, some cities do support millimeter wave, but the number of base stations is just ridiculously low. Uh, in Europe, in fact, uh, iPhones such as this one don't even have millimeter wave antennas. So even if there are any base stations, 
we just can't even connect to them. Moving on from the physical limitations of hardware at the moment, let's just assume that at some point in future we will be able to create and roll out new hardware. Well, are we all gonna get cancer then? Probably not. Um, in fact, electromagnetic radiation from the sun, which is the most uh, uh, kind of common source of electromagnetic radiation, uh, which allows us to exist, uh, contains the spectrum of the entire range, uh, starting from uh, conventional gigahertz all the way up to gamma rays and beyond. Um, some of this spectrum is actually quite dangerous, as uh, the aforementioned gamma rays and uh, in particular ultraviolet spectrum um, that can actually and does cause cancer. However, the, the other under ultraviolet or the light spectrum allows us to see. So it tends to be quite useful and it also keeps us warm. Below the visible light spectrum lies the infrared spectrum and the millimeter wave spectrum. The sun does emit radio waves in millimeter wave spectrum and infrared spectrum and with uh, some relatively sophisticated tools we can see them. So the bottom line is it hasn't killed us yet and uh, it's unlikely that when we start using the spectrum for communications that it will do so as well. Nevertheless, as hardware designers, we need some sort of a metric to measure electromagnetic fields and uh, exposure limits because, of course, uh, the sun is quite far away and our antennas are much closer, so maybe there are some risks associated with that. The three main metrics for evaluation of electromagnetic field exposure are the electromagnetic field radiation, uh, which can be measured according to uh, total radiating power, as I described in one of my previous videos. The second metric is the absorbed power density or incident power density, which are related to each other. And the third metric is a specific absorption rate. I am most familiar with the third metric, which is a specific absorption rate, which is typically required to be tested for any device that is to be used within 20 centimeters proximity from human head or body, such as a smartphone. The evaluation of SIR is performed in accordance with IEC 62311 International Standard for the spectrum up to 300 gigahertz. So millimeter wave is covered by that as well. In the European Union, the limits are two watt per kilogram measured from 10 gram of tissue. And in the United States, the limits are 1.6 gram per kilogram measured from one gram of tissue. Typically, the SIR testing is quite complicated and very expensive because you have to put a water-filled mannequin inside an anechoic chamber and measure the radiated power inside this mannequin and uh, how much of it has been absorbed by a specific part of the body. SIR measurement also becomes quite challenging at higher frequencies such as millimeter wave and uh, very often standards prefer to specify absorbed power density instead. In the slides I'm showing you the uh, limits for all three uh, of uh, the metrics for evaluation of electromagnetic field exposure for 5G uh, and as well as the standards that are applying and specifying those limits. Those tables come from a very nice uh, research paper that I will put a link to in description. Please uh, feel free to read it and uh, uh, you will find quite a lot of useful information about uh, 5G health risks there as well. So as you can see, the developed standards for the measurement of electromagnetic field exposure are quite sophisticated and in my opinion are much more uh, detailed compared to, let's say, the situation that was during the rollout of 2G or 3G. 
where everything was kind of uh, new and uh, people were putting base stations for the first time and very often the electromagnetic field exposure was not thought of at all. So what I'm trying to say here is that we now know more about it than we did ever in our history. And we have very good metrics for evaluation and simulation of electromagnetic field exposure. And in future videos, I will uh, try to make a view about uh, simulation of specific absorption rate, for example, because it can be done in uh, CST Microwave Studio, and it's a very interesting process. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I've been able to uh, answer a few uh, burning questions that are uh, associated with 5G and the health risks and so on. And as you can see, the rollout of 5G is nowhere near where it really needs to be. And um, any kind of reported hazards are just made up and uh, pure conspiracies that are not based on anything. However, that is not to say that we should not measure electromagnetic field exposure. In fact, we do, and we continuously create new research in the 5G Innovation Center dedicated to this topic, and we develop new standards and new measurement techniques for evaluation of electromagnetic field exposure. Please follow the research of my colleague Ahmed Al Zanati and uh, uh, you will find lots more useful information about it in his profile on Google Scholar. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, please uh, like and subscribe. And like I said, I will make more videos dedicated to this topic. As always, if you have any questions, please just uh, email me or uh, comment below. I will uh, aim to respond as soon as possible.